Rick and Louie walk off into the mist. Indy and his friends ride off into the sunset. Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock f inside a crash train in front of everyone. Everyone. They f in front of everyone. We all love a great movie ending. A tight, iconic moment can seal an already cracking film in the pantheon of classics. But what's hard to ignore are endings that leave you with a hanging question. The credits may roll for the audience, but life goes on for the characters, right? Leaving nagging thoughts and confusing plot holes to unravel. I'm Adam from WhatCulture.com, and here are 10 awkward moments that must have happened after the end of famous movies. Spoilers, obviously. Number 10, Marty discovers what he's changed back to the future. Marty McFly is one lucky teenager. Not only is he the only person to ever drive a car up to 88 miles per hour and actually travel in time rather than travel to prison for speeding, he manages to completely mess up his parents' meeting, only for a solution to actually make things better. He comes home to find the car of his dreams, a rich father, a cool mother, and better siblings. Well, the last one's pretty much debatable. Assuming his later meddling in the sequels didn't change things too much, he's got a pretty sweet life ahead of him. Well, he might, but the odds are he's gonna be a tourist throughout most of it, when he wakes up at the end of Back to the Future, a few minor changes totally floor him. But it's pretty naive to think that this is all he's affected. Think of all the people from his time that'll never have existed, or have died, or be completely fundamentally different because of his significant changes. Marty did so much in the past that the 1985 he's returned to is probably as crazy as the Biff-led one. There's two options for him, confess to his family and get sectioned, or slowly struggle through a world he knows nothing about. Number 9. Magneto gets released. X-Men The Last Stand. After the worst tactical battle ever committed to film, note for the next time the real world isn't like a chess game. In chess, the pawns go first. And a sloppy adaptation of one of the X-Men's best storylines, The Last Stand still clearly thought it would get a sequel. There's a mid credit sting where Professor X went to all source code, nicking the mind of a vegetative dude, while the actual ending has Magneto playing chess, he'll never learn, with his previously assumed gone powers. Let me just get this straight. Magneto destroys the Golden Gate Bridge, commands the deaths of countless soldiers, leads to an incredibly destructive battle, and then is free? I know he's meant to have lost his abilities, but you don't let a crazed gunman free when you've got his revolver off him, do you? This means in Brett Ratner's X-Men universe, there's a moment where a group of officials release Mr. Magnus Nito and tell him, please don't do anything naughty again. Pretty, pretty, please. That's dumb. Number eight, Mindy realizes she can't look after herself, Kick-Ass 2. The recent Kick-Ass sequel has a surprisingly optimistic ending, leaving a third entry with a lot of setting up to do. The mother supposedly dies, superheroes return to their normal lives, except it seems Dave, and Hit Girl leaves New York. Aside from that unexpected kiss, it's an ending pretty much brighter than the films it's riffing off. Problem is, what's gonna happen to Hit Girl? Cause she spent her entire life training to be a superhero and this very film showed that she was incredibly inept at normal social situations. Yet at the end, we see her thinking she could start a new life. There's not a chance she'll succeed, right? She's a 15-year-old girl. Setting herself up in a new city is going to be a nightmare, considering that Mr. Cage hadn't spent his life prepping her on how to find an apartment, enroll in a new school, or start a small business without anyone in authority asking why she's on her own and underage. No, he's prepped her on how to murder everyone instead, which might be how she gets out of that whole social awkwardness thing. Number seven, Han remembers Hoth, Star Wars Return of the Jedi. Good triumphs over evil and everyone gets drunk with the Ewoks. That's how Return of the Jedi ends and with it comes the resolution of the love triangle. Han gets the girl because the other guy was her brother. Ha <laughs> ha, classic. It's all cute when Han learns about Luke and Leia. He's my brother. They laugh at him not knowing a secret she just found out and then they cuddle an Ewok. But... Does Han think this has been general knowledge he missed out while at Jabba's? Well, I'm sure while he was happy with his new girlfriend at the end or after party, doubts will have to set in eventually. After all, there must come a time where he confronts Leia about that thing that happened in Hoth. You know, when she leans over Luke and she kisses him really sexy. It's going to be a really embarrassing chat and it is going to have to happen. Number six, Henry falls back into drugs and gets kicked out of witness protection, Goodfellas. This one's a tad different given that Goodfellas is a pretty close adaptation of a real life gangster Henry Hill's rise and fall, but it's a story still worth mentioning on the list, if on a more of a somber basis. Well, I'm funny how? I mean funny like I'm a clown, I amuse you? Martin Scorsese's defining gangster epic ends with what was then the present situation. Hill sells out his gangster friends in exchange for his own case being dropped and entry into the witness protection program. After selling his story for a novel and movie adaptation, Henry Hill's life wasn't the boring one the film suggested. He divorced from his wife and was eventually kicked out of witness protection after a string of drug-related crimes. In fact, he was in trouble with the law up until a couple of years before his death in 2011. 
Number five, David and Elise realize they know nothing about each other, the Adjustment Bureau. The Adjustment Bureau, despite not making the biggest impact in the world, was pretty damn good. After a Monsters Inc. style chase through New York, it ended with Matt Damon and Emily Blunt, who can't be together due to a bureaucracy defined destiny, finally allowed to love. Thing is, Will they actually work? The forbidden fruit angle to their relationship is gone now, and they actually don't know that much about each other to begin with, other than the fact they can't have each other, which will cause potential problems when they move beyond the whole you're pretty and I'll give my life in face of an all-powerful force for you phase into an actual relationship with, you know, dishwashing and stuff. After all, it was a wise bullock in speed who once said, I've heard relationships based on intense experiences never work. Number four, Clark convinced all of Smallville to keep his secret, Man of Steel. Although Man of Steel managed to present a twist on pretty much every element of the Superman origin, the spaceship of solitude, the lack of red underwear, him murdering a dude, Zack Snyder still deemed it necessary to have Clark Kent's only disguise be a pair of glasses. The film ends with Kal-El taking up the Superman mantle and slotting into the real world as a Daily Planet reporter. However, the people who know Clark as soups are Lois Lane, Ma Kent, potentially some of the army, and all of Smallville. Let's not forget that everyone in his hometown knows about the whole school bus incident, and when the Kryptonians attack the Kent home first, odds are many people are going to join those dots, which means if Clark didn't want them running to the press with a juicy expose, there must have been a moment where he approached the entire town and asked them to keep mum. Number three, Bonnie grows up and gives away some of her toys, Toy Story 3. After Up, Pixar seemed to be trying to one-up itself on the pulling tears from adult stakes to the extent that Toy Story 3 has two contending moments within 10 minutes of each other. Just after we've seen the gang accept their fiery fate at the dump, we're treated to Andy giving away all of his old toys. Still, it's a happy ending with Woody and Co. After all, they have been saved from the attic. For now. After all, if the point of the film is that toys are meant to be passed on to the youth of now, not hoarded away, in a few years, Bonnie will grow out of the toys, but what makes it really awkward is that some of the toys are more boy-oriented and likely to be given up quicker than others, splitting up the beloved family for good. Number two, Ripley has to hide a body on a bustling ship for weeks, the talented Mr. Ripley. The film adaptation of the talented Mr. Ripley made quite a few changes from the stellar Patricia Highsmith novel, most notably taking this sexually ambiguous character and clearly insinuating that he's gay. But there's more than that. The rather insular ending is replaced by a Dark Knight-esque conundrum, where Tom Ripley can only keep his psychopathic side secret by either killing his lover or a girl on holiday with her family. Unlike Batman, the killer finds it an easy choice and goes for the former. Sadly though, the logistics just don't make sense. Ripley strangles lover Peter in his cabin, but can't do anything about his body. Throw him over board he'll just be fished out and the police will come after Ripley and if you leave him be a cleaner will find the body. We either get a weekend of Bernie style escapade or a slapstick sequence channeling the dead body episode of Faulty Towers. And number one, no one believes Harry about Voldemort's death, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2. Harry Potter ended in an epic battle that had all the sets you knew and loved blown to bits by fireworks. The climax was a deadly showdown between Harry and Voldemort, where the young wizard finally bested the Dark Lord in both wits and spellcasting and also having the best wand. Evil is dead and the old gang can all live to grow middle-aged unconvincingly. Yay, Voldemort's dead! Problem is... You've got to prove it. Halfway through the last film, the key villains inexplicably start exploding into tiny pieces when killed. We can only assume this is done so there's no way for them to be brought back, but it means it's so easy for someone to accuse Harry of lying. After all, look at the world around us now. It's full of conspiracy theorists, and this is a world governed by science, mostly. In a magical world, and let's not forget it took people a full year for people to believe that Voldemort was back in the first place, there'll be a schism in society leading to loads of cultists and truthers proclaiming the Dark Lord never died. The book didn't have this issue. Not only was Tom Riddle's body left in one piece, but Harry beat him with a massive audience of wizards in the Great Hall. I guess he could use a truth potion on Harry, but interrogating a conquering hero is a hell of an awkward moment, especially after everything he's been through. And that's our list. Did we miss any out? Tell us about it in the comments. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter here. I'm Adam from whatculture.com, and I'll see you soon.